collection, we remain collecting more from services. So this means that, like the director has said, we have to come up with policies of how we can promote industrialization, um, import substitution, so that Ugandans are able to compete favorably in their available markets. Now, some of the decisions, without taking a lot of time, that the director has mentioned that we are going to implement come 1st July 2021. Key one is the various tariff lines across all garments, regardless of what is made by the local players. And uh, Uganda has requested for a stay of application in the East African EEC Common External Tariff the rate of 0%, 10%, and 25%, and asked to apply a duty rate of 35% or $3.5 per kilogram, whichever is higher for one year. Now, this is intended to promote the textile sector in Uganda. So to Ugandans out there, get to know that this is not to harm you or hurt you, but it is in line with the government policy of making sure that we promote industrialization, especially in the textile sector. We have been importing a lot of wheelbarrows, like you also know. Now, why should we import wheelbarrows when there is a MYOGA program promoting the youth to get engaged in metal fabrications and everything? So we think this year a stay of 10%, introducing ESE rate of 10% uh, for one year to apply it at 25%, is basically to promote local content in that area. There are many others. The director has talked of meat and edible meat offers. Uganda has a lot of cows, but we are still importing offers, yet others are throwing away offers. And, and I think that is why the director is saying we need to put some bit of protection in this regard. Uh, of course, also in the area of paper and paper labels, uh, batteries, crude palm oil, I cannot mention all of them, but the idea is that these items which we are going to publish, please follow them and adjust your, your plans to make sure you fit into the new rates that we have announced come 1st of July of 2021. I want to thank the organizers for this program, and I want to assure you that as Uganda Revenue Authority, we are ready. The directive was that the one-stop border posts should be functional. I want to assure you that under the single customs territory, we are working well on all borders, seamlessly. Even when you go to Mombasa, our officers work with Kenya Revenue Authority officers. Even in Tanzania, our officers work with Tanzania Revenue officers. The only border which is being still constructed on the South Sudan side is a legu. And the directive was that we should immediately start working with South Sudan officials on the side of Uganda, and Ugandans should shift and go to South Sudan. On Mutukura side, the border is working very well. If it comes to transit of goods throughout Uganda to other neighboring countries in the East African region, the regional electronic cargo tracking system is up and running. The ministers directed that government should fund it, in, as we wait for funding to come through, which they have already authorized, we've already partnered with Kenya in the spirit of the East African community to make sure that they host the server for the regional electronic cargo tracking system. And now goods are being tracked right away from Mombasa. You're able to see where they are going into Juba and into Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo and up to Rwanda. So that one is already being worked on and it's working. The other area we've worked on in line with the directives is the automation of our systems being linked to all the East African communities. So I'm able to see what has come in at the port and most of our traders now pay taxes at the port of Mombasa before they even come to Kampala. So our system here in Uganda is interlinked with the system in Kenya and the system in Tanzania. And that is one of the directives. So I want to assure Ugandans and uh, participants here, that URA is ready. We are ready come 1st July 2021 to implement some of these decisions. They are for our own good. They are for our good of the, our country. 
and the good of the region as we also try to access markets beyond the East African region. I thank you. Commissioner, thank you very much. Uh, the panelists are here laughing because URA sent us a person in charge of health. Uh, once you come to this microphone, he showers you with sanitizer. Yeah, so we're making sure that we are safe. Commissioner, did you say that we import offers? Or offers, offers? The one of Katogo with offers. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you, as you follow the discussion here today, at least from the, uh, the two keynote presentations we've received, you're starting to get perspective on where we are at in relation to harmonization, especially of tax measures as the East Africa region. Some of the challenges have been made clear, but I'd like to let you know that civil society organizations here in Uganda have done a comprehensive study. And uh, now we're going to receive a presentation on the analysis, uh, the civil society's analysis on the East Africa tax measures uh, for financial years 2018-2019. It's a period of time. So starting from the financial year 2018-2019 to financial year 2020-2021 and uh, to give uh, to present uh, this analysis is Ms. Jane Nalunga the executive director uh, Siatini Uganda Jane you're very welcome Um, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, uh, even those who are w watching us virtually. Um, I would like to take also this opportunity uh, to thank our partners, uh, government, especially the Minister of Finance and URA, uh, for the very, very great collaboration with uh, us as civil society. Uh, for me, I think this has really, really been great. And I hope uh, other ministries can also do the same, give civil society space to cooperate and partner. I would also like to thank our other partners uh, who have been partnering with the uh, URA and Ministry of Finance, uh, that CS Bag and our code have also a very great uh, collaboration and partnership. Um, distinguished, distinguished participants, I'm going to present a study which we are we are about to finalize. That's why we are we are presenting it so that we get your views. It isn't off and omega. This is our perceptions. We did a study. This is what we we did find out, and I hope we can be able to give us inputs. So the study is on the analysis of tax measures in the East African community member states. Are we moving towards a harmonized uh, tax system? Uh, that's the question uh, we wanted to answer uh, in this uh, presentation. Um, that's our presentation outline. Uh, we'll look at uh, the introduction, 
uh, then we we'll talk about the ESC uh, tax harmonization ag agenda. Uh, then we we'll look at uh, the study research. Uh, then we will present the findings, uh, whether we are progressing towards tax harmonization or not. Uh, then we will also discuss the challenges. What are the challenges to tax harmonization? Then uh, last year we we'll present some proposals on uh, the implication, uh, but also on um, on the way the way forward. Um, the tax harmonization agenda, as the previous speakers, distinguished uh, speakers, have all pointed out, that the tax harmonization uh, uh, tax harmonization is provided for under the ESC treaty. Um, there, there are a number of provisions in this treaty, Article 83, which provides for the harmonization of domestic tax policies with a view of removing tax distortions in order to bring about a more efficient allocation of resources within the community. Another article is 81F, uh, which seeks to harmonize and rationalize investment incentives in order to promote the community as a single investment area. And then Article 81F also, it addresses the issue of double, uh, double taxation. So what, what's tax harmonization? And why are we talking about tax harmonization? Uh, tax harmonization, most of you know, is not about having the same tax laws and tax rates. Uh, its, its aim, the aim of tax harmonization, is to prevent any national tax measures that would have a negative effect on the free movement of goods, services, and capital within the community, and that would also distort competition. So it isn't that you want to, to have the same, exact same, um, same, same rates. Um, it's a process of adjusting the tax systems of di different uh, uh, countries so as to achieve common uh, fiscal objectives. So the, the key issue is to have common fiscal, to achieve common fiscal objectives, but also to facilitate uh, the flow of goods, capital, and services. Um, why, why do we talk about tax harmonization? Is to avoid poten potential risks associated with engaging in tax competition, especially when it regards uh, corporate tax rates, but also other taxes. It's also about avoiding a race to the bottom when we are, we are attracting investments as through generous a tax incentive. So it's against this background mm, that tax harmonization is very, very important for our region. That we commissioned, our study was commissioned by several, several partners. Those are the partners, uh, East African Tax and Gender Network in Kenya, the Policy Forum in Tanzania, Duhingire ECHU in Burundi, Governance for Africa in Rwanda, Transparency International in Kenya, Tax Justice Network Africa, it's an African uh, network, then Diaconia. Uh, those are the partners which undertook the study. So for any errors, I shouldn't be sacrificed it's to those, those organizations. I'm just a messenger. So what were the objectives of this study? The objectives of this study was to assess, to assess the extent um, to which harmonization of tax, domestic tax laws in the East African partner states have been uh, undertaken. Then also to assess the extent of tax harmonization of domestic tax laws in the partner states and lastly to identify factors that explain the current progress or non-progress, whatever the case, 
of tax, the tax harmonization agenda. So what were the findings? Um, maybe just to say that, we, that the study was undertaken in those different countries. Uh, it's, a, it's a big study. We are just um, giving a summary uh, that we, um, we, we, we reviewed a number of documents, but we also uh, had interviews with a number of people. Um, one is that the provision on tax harmonization, the ESC treaty, are still very general. You know, they are general provisions. They haven't yet been um, unpacked. Then two, the common complaint among partner states is that there are no specific guiding principles. Then three, there is a draft code of conduct against harmful tax competition in the community, which was developed as far back as 2011. However, to date, the code is not yet adopted and therefore not implemented. And for us, this was very critical that there is a code, but that code of conduct hasn't yet been um, addressed, uh, implemented. Um, still on the findings, um, progress of the ESC uh, tax harmonization, what we found out was that in terms of design and principle, uh, the ESC tax systems are harmonized when it comes to uh, principles. Uh, for example, in terms of charging taxes, um, apart from there are some fees and some fees which vary, but um, in terms of taxes, uh, there is a uh, there is a, a high level of uh, harmonization. Apart from Rwanda, as you can see, uh, which doesn't uh, uh, provide for uh, stamp duty, but other countries, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda, we didn't do by the way South Sudan. We didn't, so about that. So the corporate tax, it's harmonized. The presumptive tax, harmonized rental taxes harmonized, payroll taxes like pay as you earn uh, harmonized, rental income tax harmonized, withholding tax harmonized, um, and also excise duty, value added tax harmonized, gaming and sport betting harmonized, stamp duty like I've said it's Rwanda which doesn't levy stamp duty, other fees and levies are also harmonized. So like we said, we found out uh, fees vary significantly. And we found out that Uganda charges more uh, fees than other, other countries. Um, when it comes to direct taxation, um, we also found that the principle of direct taxation, there is also uh, harmonization. Uh, that uh, taxation uh, on, uh, on direct taxes is uh, based on the principle of imposing income taxes on individuals and corporations or on, on based on residence and worldwide principle. And this principle cuts across the, uh, the four the partner states, the four partner states. Um, uh, uh, in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, residents income is charged on their worldwide income. And for non-residents, income tax is charged on income only sourced from the country. Um, when it comes to personal income taxes, we saw that they greatly vary, especially for low-income earners. Please go down. For low income earners, uh, that's the personal income tax uh, taxes. Uh, when you look at the, um, the, the, the table, uh, you look at um, 
for personal income incomes below $67. And this is how it is in Uganda, below $67. Mm? The rate is 10%. In fact, people start paying in Uganda and Rwanda. People start paying in Uganda, you start paying taxes uh, 67 when you earn $67, start earning $67. Uh, in Rwanda, $30, you start paying taxes. Um, at least it's a bit better, better in Kenya, because you start earning when you earn $223, and in Tanzania, when you earn $116. So for for Rwanda and, uh, and, and Uganda, it's, uh, it's terrible. In fact, one time we were, we were proposing, they increase it at least to, to 500, you know, so that people start uh, paying taxes when they earn 500,000, so that you can be able to have some money to spend in your pocket, uh, and I hope um, Mr. Kagua, you can you will be able to take on that request. Um, what we found out on on the issue of personal income tax again, the rates, is that there is a, a, a level of harmonisation for the um, those earning more money, mm? those high earning higher higher income. For example, in Uganda. The people who are earning more than, you know, around 2,835. Two That's around, around 10 million. Mm? They, are, they are paying $823. In Rwanda, they are paying 815 uh, In Kenya, 892 In Tanzania, around seven, 721 so there is a level of harmonization for people earning at that, at that high level. So again, this is an area which needs uh, harmonization, especially for low income, income earners. Um, then the issue of the corporate, uh, corporate uh, income tax. The issue of corporate income tax um, they are rates which um, their rates are harmonized uh, because Uganda uh, it's uh, thirty percent um, for Kenya resident companies thirty percent also although branches of foreign companies uh, which are in Kenya pay thirty seven point five percent Tanzania Rwanda thirty thirty uh, percent. But when it comes to capital gains tax, Uganda, um, we charge 30. Uh, for Kenya, in fact, Kenya didn't have, it was reintroduced in 2015. They didn't have capital gains tax. And the rate now is 5%. Uh, for Tanzania, it's... Uh, a flat rate of 20% and 10% for residents. So we are saying that it needs to be harmonized. For Kenya, 5% is very low. And this is what we call that competition. You know, it, it's, um, it, needs, to be, it needs to be harmonized. Um, when it comes to VAT, VAT rates, exempt and zero rated items um, there is a, a also a level a level of harmonization um, it has already been reached when we talk about VAT which is very good uh, excluding Kenya uh, all other states their VAT is 18 percent but Kenya charges 16% VAT, which isn't 2% 2 is uh, maybe the URA will tell us whether two, the difference of 2% is a problem. But then we saw the problem 
is on petroleum oils, 8%. And it has implication on, on trading in fuels. 8% is very low. Um, uh, then we saw that all countries had preferential tre treatment of exempt or zero rated welfare support goods and services. Uh, and I think this has been pointed out by uh, Mr. Kagwa. Uh, but there are also differences in VAT law, which exists on items listed under the exempt and zero rated schedules. Um, but when it comes to excise duty, the rates are, you know, the structure is a bit uh, complex uh, because every country has a mix of uh, tax rates, specific tax rates, and uh, ad volume tax rates which exist. Uh, maybe specific rates is where they say fuel, uh, shillings, 100 shillings. But ad volume, that's where they say 5% maybe of the value, percentage of the value. So there is a mix in, a number, in countries um, regarding that. Um, and this is a, a, an obstacle if when you are comparing the tax burden on the goods being taxed. Um, because the, if you want an exact comparison, the, the best prices as well as the quality has to be identified. So it's difficult to compare uh, the exercise duties. We found it a bit difficult. Um, regarding the issue of tax incentives, um, the issue regarding um, all countries, all the partner states, we found out they have incentives that amount to tax exemptions. Uh, for investors. And we found that there are significant differences regarding the tax incentives which are applied. Kenya and Uganda have automatic tax exemption regime where the taxpayer meets the set criteria. No? Uh, like in all, in all our laws, they will say, uh, for example, um, companies which are in the industrial parks they exempted, you know, automatically. Uh, Tanzania requires a minister to exercise description uh, to grant the exemptions. There are, however, executive exemptions in Uganda. You know, we know that, you know, though they are not statutory. Uh, Uganda and Kenya have time-bound exemptions for 10 years. Uh, why Tanzania exception regime is not limited by time. It's open open-ended. Uganda has an elaborate regime that lists the qualifying sectors. Um, in fact, I think each year, even this year, uh, it was there, the list is there. In Kenya and Tanzania, regimes are wider without being limited to specific sectors. Uh, Tanzania has used the CIT rate in some sectors, while Uganda and Kenya only have the 10 year exemptions. Uganda tries to favor local industries and ES citizens. In fact, Uganda will have gone by the late of the treaty. You know, and you remember the whole issue of our local content bill. You know, the president was saying, uh uh, ESC. But we found uh, our other partners, the states, they are quiet about ESC. Uh, when it comes even to giving incentives. Um, our study was looking at the last four years, uh, that are we, for the last four years, are we moving towards tax harmonization or not? And this, these are our conclusions, whether we are moving towards tax harmonization or not that there is a uh, limited uh, deliberate efforts to harmonize tax laws at the ESC level. If it was in school, say so we need to pull up our socks. Uh, it mainly happens, hmm? there has been some tax harmonization. And I think uh, um, uh, Mr. Moses Kagwa pointed out those areas of tax harmonization. But what we found out 
was that it was because of benchmarking. You know, when you are policymakers, when they are amending their laws in the Ministry of Finance, they benchmark what is Kenya doing, what is that country doing, you know, then you come up with those laws. But it's not a deliberate effort that we are harmonizing our, our laws. Unlike the common external tariff, uh, which uh, uh, Mr. Moses Kagwa clearly elaborated on, amendments are approved at the ESC level when it comes to the ECET. And he pointed out to the discussions, the ongoing discussions under the CET. However, domestic tax amendments are done in isolation. No, Kenya, we see, Uganda, we sit and we do our domestic tax amendments. There are few cases where domestic laws are discussed at the ESC level. Uh, for example, we found out in 2018, uh, partner states agreed to level, to le to, not to levy, to exclude VAT on some essential goods and services that are consumed domestically as medical supplies and educational materials. And I think there is also another instance where uh, which uh, uh, Mr. Moses Kagwa pointed out. But these are few cases, and what we are saying that it would be good, you know, to have uh, such more um, uh, discussions uh, regarding amendments on the uh, 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 domestic tax amendments. So what are the challenges when it comes to, uh, to tax harmonization? Why aren't we moving towards tax harmonization, despite the, tax, the, the fact that the ESC, uh, uh, the, the ESC treaty clearly provides for of tax harmonization. Um, the, the issue of a lack of a guiding principles on tax harmonization. Um, the code of conduct, um, which was developed almost 10 years ago, hasn't yet been adopted. Then, like you have pointed out, the process of amending the tax laws are also done in isolation. And sometimes it brings out, you know, member countries, you know, going away from, you know, a middle point of harmonizing their tax laws. Then there is also the issue of individualism among uh, partner states. Uh, they are more, they look inwards, we look inwards um, uh, to, into our domestic matters instead of the uh, community matters. There is also fear of revenue, revenue losses. Um, there is also the issue of weak M and E framework, monitoring and evaluation framework in the ES agenda on tax harmonization. We benchmarked uh, the EU code of conduct, you know, and we found that EU had a code of conduct. Uh, they even put in place um, a, a committee, you know, so, so it would also be good for the ESC to benchmark on what the EU is doing. In fact, by 2019, the EU had done an assessment of their domestic laws, 700 assessments of domestic laws. So we can be able to use that example of the EU code of conduct. And lastly, the challenge is lack of political support and also some levels of uh, intra-community misunderstanding. Hmm? For example, the EU code of conduct is not legally by binding, but it has very strong uh, political, political support. So why are we pushing for tax harmonization? What are the implications of tax harmonization? Uh, as already recognized by ESC, regional integration can't be achieved without tax harmonization. The two go together. And as previous speakers have already pointed out, the free movement of capital goods cap uh, and capital goods and services, we need a harmonized uh, tax, uh, ta -ta -ta tax policies. Uh, tax harmonization also plays an important role in mitigating tax competition 
which has significant co implications on the race to the bottom. You know? It's already happening, competing for investors. But at the end of the day, the benefits go to the investors, not to, to our countries. And I think there is a need to study welfare implication across the region. For example, in Uganda and Rwanda, personal income tax rates greatly affect the low income earners. What are the implications of that? Can we be able to have to address that as a region? And sometimes a lack of tax harmonization raises the appetite to smuggle, especially if one country has, you know, those differing uh, tax rates. So what are our suggestions on the way forward? Um, the code of conduct against harmful tax competition should be adopted and implemented. You know? And maybe there is a need to revisit it uh, because it was um, put in place, it was put in place 10 years back. It can be revisited to see whether it's uh, fit for purpose now, but the whole idea is to have uh, that uh, code of conduct um, implemented. And we're also proposing that a committee should be instituted to monitor and report on tax harmonization in the ESC. Uh, but already I, I, I think there is a, a, a committee um, uh, which uh, Mr. Abel, you and also Mr. Moses Kagwa, you pointed out. The ES Committee on Fiscal Affairs, maybe it's a matter of uh, giving that, uh, that, that committee uh, this role. There is also a need to put a requirement that at least mm, those domestic tax amendments pass through that committee to, 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 to verify, to assess whether they are leading to tax harmonization. If not all the taxes, at least the tax incentives should be agreed on at the ESC level. Uh, and I think we also need to estimate the cost and benefit of tax harmonization. Most people just look at the cost, but we also need to assess uh, the benefit. Um, and there is also a, a proposal which we put forward to develop an online platform that tracks tax amendments across the region. Uh, this will support uh, is a comparison and subsequently allow for early intervention against harmful uh, tax measures within uh, the region. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was uh, the, the findings of the study. We, their findings and we we, we ask for uh, proposals to enrich it. You can say that isn't right, that's wrong, and, but the whole issue is to be able to work towards harmonizing our, our tax policies within the region so that we, we promote um, uh, regional, deeper regional integration, integration. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jen Nalunga, Executive Director, Siatini Uganda, uh, for sharing with us uh, the uh, results from the analysis done by civil society on harmonization of tax laws in the East African region, looking at financial years 2018-2019 to 2021-2022. Uh, very long period of time, which uh, uh, you will agree with me, uh, she's done an amazing job at trying to bring that in about 20 or so minutes. Uh, but you realize that uh, a number of questions were raised in relation to some of the things we had had earlier on. In a very short while, we are going to have uh, responses. Uh, in fact, we're going to have uh, reactions to uh, the findings from civil society. And so we'd also like to get uh, your responses uh, on these findings. So please remember, send us your comment. Use the hashtag ESC 
uh, Budget 21, ESC Budget 21. That's if you are on social media. If you are joining us via the Zoom platform, please uh, just leave a question or comment in the Q&A or in the chat uh, on the Zoom platform. And in a very short while, uh, we will be returning with a panel discussion where we, I will put those questions uh, to our panelists. For now, uh, you can go uh, stretch your legs, catch a coffee, and in about three minutes, we will be uh, having our panel discussion. Thank you very much. A TIN is not mandatory when generating an e-invoice or receipt for a sale to final consumers. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. If the purchaser is a business that is not registered for tax, i.e. without a TIN, such a sale should be classified by the seller as a sell to a final consumer. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. No form of identification has been specified by URA as mandatory for issuance of an e-invoice or e-receipt. In case of a sell to a final consumer, the buyer is required to provide any of the following name, contact, taxpayer identification number, TIN, or national identification number. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. The Value Added Tax Act 1996 requires that the buyer's details are indicated on a tax invoice required to be issued by every VAT registered seller. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. The URA refund process is faster with IFRIS system. The refund claims are only allowed where e-receipts or e-invoices generated from an IFRI system are used. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. A TIN is not mandatory when generating an e-invoice or receipt for a sale to final consumers. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. If the purchaser is a business that is not registered for tax, i.e. without a TIN, such a sell should be classified by the seller as a sell to a final consumer. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. No form of identification has been specified by URA as mandatory for issuance of an e-invoice or e-receipt. In case of a sale to a final consumer, the buyer is required to provide any of the following. Name, contact, taxpayer identification number, TIN, or National Identification Number. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. The Value Added Tax Act 1996 requires that the buyer's details are indicated on a tax invoice required to be issued by every VAT registered seller. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. The URA refund process is faster with IFRIS system. The refund claims are only allowed where e-receipts or e-invoices generated from an IFRI system are used. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together.
A TIN is not mandatory when generating an e-invoice or receipt for a sale to final consumers. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. If the purchaser is a business that is not registered for tax, i.e. without a TIN, such a sale should be classified by the seller as a sale to a final consumer. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. No form of identification has been specified by URA as mandatory for issuance of an e-invoice or e-receipt. In case of a sale to a final consumer, the buyer is required to provide any of the following Name, contact, taxpayer identification number, TIN or national identification number. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. The Value Added Tax Act 1996 requires that the buyer's details are indicated on a tax invoice required to be issued by every VAT registered seller. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. The URA refund process is faster with IFRIS system. The refund claims are only allowed where e-receipts or e-invoices generated from an IFRI system are used. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. A TIN is not mandatory when generating an e-invoice or receipt for a sale to final consumers. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. If the purchaser is a business that is not registered for tax, i.e. without a TIN, such a sale should be classified by the seller as a sale to a final consumer. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. No form of identification has been specified by URA as mandatory for issuance of an e-invoice or e-receipt. In case of a sale to a final consumer, the buyer is required to provide any of the following. Name, contact, taxpayer identification number, TIN or National Identification Number Uganda Revenue Authority Developing Uganda Together The Value Added Tax Act 1996 requires that the buyer's details are indicated on a tax invoice required to be issued by every VAT registered seller Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. The URA refund process is faster with IFRIS system. The refund claims are only allowed where e-receipts or e-invoices generated from an IFRI system are used. Uganda Revenue Authority. Developing Uganda together. Uh, 2021. Uh, we have mentioned several times that uh, one of the articles of the East African Treaty states that uh, partner states shall harmonize their tax policies with a view of removing tax distortions in order to bring about a more effective allocation of resources within the community. Our 
keynote addresses did look at that concept and where we are at uh, as a country, but specifically looking at directives from uh, the Council of Ministers. We did have a presentation uh, from a study done by civil society organizations led by Siatini, Uganda, and now we're going to have a panel discussion where we will be uh, getting responses, reactions uh, to some of uh, the things contained in uh, the report or the summary that uh, the civil society representative just gave us. Our panel is going to be, uh, will consist of uh, four people, three uh, who will be here with me and one who will join us virtually from Kenya. Uh, and so allow me to invite, uh, these are people that you have already uh, listened to, so I will invite them in reverse order, uh, that is uh, the reverse order of the way they had appeared just previously. I'll start by inviting to the panel uh, Ms. Jen Nalunga, Executive Director of Siatini. Yeah, I know we have very few in the room, but you can clap for her as she comes. Uh -huh. Excellent. I'd also like to invite to the panel uh, Mr. Abel Kagumire, Commissioner Customs, Uganda Revenue Authority. I've had you clapping for him. And then finally, uh, Mr. Moses Kagwa, Director, Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. The guest joining us uh, virtually is uh, Mr. Leonard Wanyama. He's a coordinator, East Africa Tax and Governance Network. And uh, as the technical team just makes sure that uh, Leonard can hear us, uh, the other three panelists you already know and uh, you heard them speak. And so I'll just uh, very briefly tell you who uh, Mr. Leonard Wanyama is. He, is uh, he has varied experience in development, governance, and international relations in East Africa, having consulted with the Royal uh, United Service Institute. He has also worked as a, a magazine columnist for the Nairobi Law uh, Monthly and Nairobi Business Monthly. He's a former part-time lecturer of international relations at Technical University of Kenya and Riara University, respectively. He started his career as a project officer for the Society of uh, International Development uh, for East Africa in Kenya. Mr. Wanyama is uh, a recipient of a uh, Bachelor of Arts, uh, Social Sciences, Political Science and Economics from the Catholic University of East Africa in Nairobi and uh, a BA with honors and a Master's of Arts in International Relations from the University of Whit uh, Whitwatersrand in Johannesburg. I don't know if he's able to hear us all right, as the technical team uh, makes sure that uh, Mr. Wanyama can hear and see us, I will come to the panelists that are physically present with me. And uh, since I have called people up to the panel, I'll wear my mask. So we all stay safe. You have heard, uh, especially from the presentation uh, that uh, Ms. Nalunga uh, gave on behalf of uh, Siatini and uh, uh, other civil society organizations that they've been partnering with uh, in relation to uh, tax harmonization in the East Africa region. I'll just mention that uh, whereas she ended by talking about the race to the bottom, you realize that this panel uh, uh, will be discussing uh, a race to the top. So basically the opposite of that, uh, other than having you know, partners reducing taxes so that they can, you know, uh, scoop investors here and there to the detriment of uh, uh, other partner states, uh, you know, how do we instead race to the top? I'm going to start with you, Mr. Kagwa, on your quick responses uh, to what uh, was raised uh, in the analysis. Um, thank you so much and uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, uh, a number of issues were uh, raised from the presentation by the research team of Siatini. 
and I really want to thank you so much for that. Uh, Guy, of course, you highlighted the provisions that are in the treaty on uh, harmonization, and you said they are very general, which is true, and it was intentional and deliberate, because the treaty, like the Constitution, is a general framework. It cannot go into the specifics. So there must be other documents that would give how to, uh, to implement this. So there could be no guiding principles in that treaty. When you read all of it, you go into the customs section, it lays out the general principles. You go into common market, the general principles. So fair enough, that's how treaties are written. Um, the code of conduct, of course, uh, um, against uh, what you call harmful tax com competition, yes, was uh, uh, negotiated a long time ago, but it wasn't implemented. As you know, initially we are two countries, I mean three uh, partner states, but then we brought in more partner states, including Rwanda and uh, Burundi, then now we have South Sudan. So the process somehow stalled because of the new people who came in and the the need to uh, accommodate them. Um, I also wanted to mention that you rightly uh, mentioned in that that uh, harmonization does not mean uh, having same rates. It's really having things that are almost similar. If you have the laws and they are similar, and if I go to Kenya uh, as an investor, I'll find that the laws in Kenya on my investments are the same as the laws I will find in Uganda and the laws I will find in Tanzania or Rwanda. Not the rates, but the, the basic principles of the law. That's what we do with harmonization. That's what the ES, EU did. You harmonize the laws and the base so that people understand that when you are talking about income tax, when you're talking about income tax, what do you mean by income tax? What is the base? What are you taxing? What is the income that you're taxing? So those things, are, we, as, as you saw in the ticks, we are fairly together. Our laws, we have been amending them. We started with the VAT. When uh, Kenya started implementing the VAT, we copied a lot of it and brought it into Uganda. And then Tanzania, Rwanda, uh, joined, uh, followed suit in having a law that is almost harmonized. Um, when we did our income tax reform in 1997, Kenya followed a bit with uh, amending there so that we could have almost the same principles of taxation of income. And that's what also Tanzania did. If you look at the Tanzanian law, you may even be mistaken, thinking that it's the Ugandan law. There are a few things that change, but uh, on the whole, it's a harmonized uh, 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 situation. Uh, on the so on, uh, on something that you raised and said, okay, the thresholds for personal income tax are low for Uganda and, Tanzan and uh, Rwanda. I think that is what you call a policy choice at the country level. And we are discussing to see what should actually be the optimum. So if you are saying it's low, what should it be? Should it be as high as Kenya? What drives the, what are the considerations for having a threshold? Okay. So those things, we, we, we needed to look at them. But she suggested $100. $100. When the minimum rate, when you go to a place and nobody is paying their employees $100. $100. So you look at the circumstances in your country. Because there's no minimum wage. And uh, people... I'm telling you, so many establishments pay less than $100 a month. So w w what you do is to say, let everybody make a humble contribution. And for us, that's how we are looking at it. Make a humble contribution. If you are earning 240,000 shillings, how much do you pay in tax on that 240,000 shillings? You pay 500 shillings. And, and I wonder whether someone really would have uh, a lot of quarrels if they told them that uh, you are going to pay 500 shillings. If they tell you you are going to have your, your, 
your salary increased by 500 shillings. I don't think you would clap. So that is the contribution. It's so paltry. So let's look at all these facts. Uh, and I wish uh, we really uh, uh, we can push our private sector, if they can, to up up to up the the minimum salary they are giving to people. But the contribution, people should be actually proud and say, well, despite the fact that I earn so little, but I've contributed to the national good. I've contributed to the security of this country. I've contributed to the health system of this country that when I go to Chirudu, I can get at least uh, medicine. So those are some of the things. Uh, on, um, on excise duty, I just wanted also to mention that uh, we, we have done some harmonization work. Unfortunately, we haven't moved since uh, 2019, uh, but uh, we had agreed to harmonize the base and say so we start with tobacco products, alcoholic beverages, non-alcoholic beverages, fuel, and we move on. And I think we shall uh, be there. On the differences in tax incentives, I agree. We have a lot of differences, and that leads to a race to the bottom. But what we are doing as a country, and I think we are going to follow suit in the region, is to look at the incentives that we have and to cost their benefits. So we are going to have what you call a tax expenditure framework that is going to look at what are the benefits. Have we gotten uh, employment? Because now for us we insist that you must employ at least 75% of everybody you are employing must be Ugandan and you must be giving them uh, on your wage bill. It must be going to those people. So we, we are looking at all that. Have we provided employment? Have we provided value addition? So are you helping our farmers get a market for their products? Have you added value to these products, our Ugandans? Are you passing on our capacity for Ugandans to do more innovations? Are you exporting? Are we getting export earnings? Once we get all that, we shall then be able to go everywhere, even in the ESC, and say, you guys, we are losing money. Because what we set out to achieve with these incentives we are not receiving. So we have decided to take some ser serious research on this matter and see that we move. I think um, on, on issue of li uh, limited deliberate efforts to harmonize tax laws, domestic tax laws, yes, we haven't moved much. But uh, there's been an effort, as I've said before, when you look at the general framework of our laws in the ESC, they are aligned. The issue of uh, these... Um, amendments, if you say you take them to the regional level, it's, it can be quite complicated. Because they are, and right now they are a preserve of national parliaments. So you can't go to ESC and then you get an agreement there and you come to parliament and parliament says, no, I don't want to do that. Then what will be the purpose of that? So we take the customs things there because we know that customs issues are resolved at the, are resolved at the regional level. But uh, we, we, we were working on this framework. As we see, we have a committee on fiscal affairs which looks at the different proposals that we are making. They look at some framework on the tax, and every year we tick where we are harmonized and where we are not, and we try to urge uh, all partner states to be harmonized. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Kagwa. I'd like to tell you that uh, later on we'll be having a second panel and uh, on that panel is somebody who served at the East African Legislative Assembly, and probably she can uh, uh, chip in on some uh, where Mr. Kagwa left off. I'd like to come to you, Mr. Kagumire, on your quick responses uh, from the presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you, Siatini, for this research. I think, I think tax harmonization is one way of how we'll first, one of the enablers for integration for the East African community. Because when we harmonize taxes, that means we will not start competing against each other. Yet we are in the same community. But nonetheless, from the findings, it is important to appreciate that we are different levels of development as partners. 
so, so that in the process of harmonization, you, you'll find that like the GDP for Kenya and Uganda, Kenya is already in middle income. You are struggling to get to middle income. Burundi is trying to get there. So as long as the collection of revenue is not yet centralized, we will still have these issues coming up in terms of harmonizing revenue, I mean taxes. I think that's what I wanted to bring up. I think the bigger picture is, can we have a central collection at one time, if it is possible, so that it becomes easy. Uh, but as long as you're saying you're collecting Uganda, Rwanda is collecting, Kenya is collecting, and you're at the different levels of development, some of these issues will still clog us and delay. But I agree in principle that harmonization of taxes is the way to go in terms of, of uh, first fostering the integration process. I also wanted to react to the issue of the VAT rates. Uh, yes, Kenya in the whole region is the one charging 16%. The rest of us are doing 18%. And, and already we are feeling it in terms of of the inflow of their goods being uh, lowly priced in Uganda, like wheat flour. You see, every time I'm deploying at the borders, Yara is deploying to fight smuggling of wheat flour from Kenya. Yet they are our neighbors here. Uh, and partly it's because they charge 16% and for us we charge 18%. So someone, Bakresa or Mandela Millers or Ergon Millers, they, they have to fight that competition because of the VAT, the VAT rate. The price will always be lower. But those are expected. But, but I always, I think the harmonization of that rate is another issue that needs to be discussed. The other aspect in the report just, was... Just before you leave the VAT, yes. because uh, Jen did raise the issue on uh, uh, whether the difference of 2% is significant. Are you saying that that 2% actually is significant? Yes, it is. It okay. is. That's why I'm saying it is impacting us, especially on the borders All right. in eastern region. And in specifically, I gave an example of that one product which right. we are fighting. That 16 so if it was harmonized, then the mm. prices would almost be eh, the same. All right, that 16% mm. is low, and yeah. you say that 2% is significant. Very. Then what of, the, we're going to come to you, Mr. Kagwa. Yes. There is the 8% VAT on uh, you know, petroleum oils. That's even much lower. Yes, I, I brought that as an example to show you how harmonization of taxes is very important as a region if we want to trade together and be together. So these committees which are set up, the fiscal, the committee on customs, every time we meet, every year before we come up with policy measures, these issues come up. But I told you the issues that fail us to harmonize relate to the way we do the collection. Okay. Yes to do the collection. We are at the different levels. So until we reach that level where you find we have one bug, maybe that's when most of these issues that are being raised in the research would be overcome. All right. I know you have uh, other things to go to, but let's just allow Mr. Kagwa to give some information in relation to VAT. Yes, um, information in relation to VAT, I wanted to say that whereas Kenya has a 16% as the VAT rate, they also have a 2% as a, a, a training levy that is imposed on a lot of manufacturers. So that compensates mm. for the 18%. So they have that 2%, which goes into the training of uh, people, um, uh, of in, uh, what do we call it, apprentices. There's that, uh, well, so when you look at the overall tax, it's actually 18%. But Even also, with that taken into consideration, URA is still struggling because the other side no, is slow and I, therefore, I wanted to tell you, something you know, they yes, smuggle. On this, um, when you look at, uh, um, at some issues, I'll give an example of milk. We used to have milk here in Uganda with VAT of 18% processed milk. But uh, we are selling more milk to Kenya than they could sell to us. So you, you, you have to look at these issues of tax very carefully because there are so many other things that determine whether you are going to smuggle this product or not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kagomere. Okay, go thank you. Dear. Then the, the other aspect I wanted to address myself to was on the exemptions 
same again, it comes to the same issue. If, if Uganda's focus is on industrialization and import substitution, and you want to grow your industries, and you add local content, then you have to grow your industrial base. How do you do that? You attract foreign direct investment, you attract investors to come here and put factories here. Uh, I think of recent, that's why the ministry came up with the, the idea of industrial parks. The industrial parks which you raised, I think it's, it's the incentives they are giving them. Me, I'm seeing they are yielding results now. If you look at a product, for example, tires, tires alone, it, it, it's like every tile that is used in Uganda was being imported. But ever since Goodwill started in Kapeka, you need to go down and see. We, I'm the one who collects import duties <laughs> on tiles. We no longer have. People prefer buying from Kapeka because they have enough supply. You have enough clay, you have enough production. And, and, and that's the beauty with, with looking at how you reduce the import bill and then concentrate more on domestic revenue mobilization. And, and I think this is where the ministry and government is focused too. So the issue should be this exemption should never be abused at any one time. So whoever gets this exemption, let it be in Hamon. We have Mbale Industrial Park, we have uh, Sheng Industrial Park, we have another one coming up in Mbarara, we have the industrial parks, we have the, the Namave. I think it is, it is a strategy that government has come up and we have already seen results, especially increasing jobs and also local production. And we even have enough enough to be consumed and also export. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me make another attempt to uh, get in touch with Mr. Wanyama. Who should be joining us on Zoom from Kenya. Sir, can you hear us? Hello? Ah, excellent. Let's get your quick uh, responses or uh, comments in relation to what was shared by Jen. And then uh, just let us know briefly uh, how uh, you're handling in yes. Kenya uh, this whole issue of harmonization. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you can see me as well, but... Um, I think from Jane's presentation, um, what, what I got was that uh, the question of um, the, the code, the, the code of conduct is what was the question that was very interesting to us. Um, this is because, and if you may, uh, let me introduce my organization, uh, the East African Tax and uh, Governance Network is a collective of individuals and state actors who are interested in tax matters across the region. And so our work is to try and um, bring out the issues of taxation in a more coordinated matter, manner so that they join up with efforts such as Yatin, uh, because we then champion the agenda of the, East, uh, the integrated East Africa in a more enterprising, prosperous, and prog progressive manner that is secure for all. Now, why the question of the code of conduct was particularly interesting to us is because of how we approach, for instance, the tax measures put in by Kenya this year. We, we looked uh, at the budget and we tried to input uh, the following principles. First, that uh, tax measures should not do more harm uh, to Kenyan citizens. Uh, second, that uh, the tax measures are equitable and fair. And third, that uh, any arbitrary measures that may have been put in the proposals are suspended. Um, these are the kind of principles we would be very keen to see in the code of conduct and in its implementation. Why? Because of the three aspects of first, the context as it is right now of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, secondly, the perspective of, uh, sorry, just one moment. The, the perspective of um, having equitable and fair uh, taxation. And um, of course, 
the idea of stopping arbitrary measures then moves us quite squarely in the space of uh, uh, tax harmonization. Um, I think what is interesting from the study is we begin to tackle a number of logics and, and issues that are out there. For instance, Leonard, when you think of the logic... Leonard, could you please enable yes. your camera? Because uh, uh, we're not able to see you. I think your camera is off. How about now? We can now, I believe we can now see you. Great. Okay. Uh, so not as, yet. As not I was, yet. Uh, I'm told not yet. Sorry about that. I've, en I've enabled the camera, but uh, on my end, I, I also can't see. Can you, oh, <laughs> okay. Can you see yourself though? No. You can't see yourself. Okay, then. Uh, your camera is not yet enabled. But okay, please please go I, ahead. The viewer will have to do with seeing me as uh, they hear you. May not be the best sight, but uh, yeah. I think we have a picture okay. of you behind uh, me. So it's okay. Let's go on. Okay. Yes. So as I was, as I was speaking about this, the, the logic of, of the question that really got my attention from Jane's presentation is um, the logic of SMEs and how to uh, deal with their issues. This is because if we take the experience we had this year in uh, providing um, tax proposals, we had the goal of supporting SMEs, revising any punishing taxes, uh, preventing tax measures that could increase the cost of business, then maybe providing alternatives that would increase revenues, uh, stopping unnecessary costs, maybe either through administrative uh, processes of the revenue authority, in our case, which is KRA, and then uh, just supporting good uh, tax proposals. So that's, in, in a nutshell, then you capture like the SMEs and you help them as a means to get increased revenues to support ourselves. This is because when I spoke of the logic of SMEs, you find issues like at this point in time, there's a lot of free movement of, 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 of individuals. Now, if you, if you take the case of right now, there's a phenomenon in Nairobi where uh, Ugandan ladies are, are, are pricing out Kenyan ladies as in terms of uh, domestic help. Now, the logic that we normally see, and this is across sectors is that what our revenue authority would do is that you tax higher then you ask the employer to be the revenue or remittance agent to carry so we would counter that and say instead of that kind of approach which is a bit more aggressive and it's very administrative why don't you support uh, cleaning agencies as a employment uh, smes you employ kenyans you employ tanzanians and you have more structured entities that you can tax, which are small little companies in place. So those are the kind of things we, we try to promote. And I see the discussion that uh, and the findings that uh, Jane raised about tax harmonization help in that uh, uh, respect. Increasingly, there's a lot of conversation about pro progressive taxation, which uh, we are happy that uh, in a gradual process, our revenue authority in Kenya and I see also in uh, Uganda are, are kind of um, embracing because of just just the, the need for understanding that you need to improve uh, domestic revenue mobilization. So that is quite uh, helpful. But then again, when you look at the realities of our economy, sometimes I think there, there are some very punitive measures that come into effect. Right now, I think the, the debt question has, is pushing revenue authorities to look for funding to solve the debt issues and also to finance service delivery. Um, if you look at the Kenyan tax proposals this year, there was an interesting uh, increase, I think, on excise in terms of confectionery uh, product, which, which is like sweets and sugars and whatnot. On the manufacturing side, this could probably mean that um, you have job losses, 
but interestingly on the on the on the side of the consumer uh, we came across uh, instances where we are being told sometimes this could limit oral health options where people who cannot afford toothpaste are relying more on the mints and so forth so just understanding those realities is really important why because our economy is in such a situation where from time to time we might say manufacturing has grown or shrunk or agriculture has grown or stagnated or that we are relying on uh, uh, service sector. but the one of the challenges of the region is that our manufacturing sector has not had any main transition and what do i mean by that that there are no new products that are coming into our manufacturing sectors in uganda lately we have seen the introduction or the the initiatives in developing i think uh, these are electric vehicles but when will that pick up so that the tax measures around those products can assist us in kenya recently there was the uh, factory on semiconductor chips but we don't know when does that when do those uh, items become productive for us in terms of taxation um, and then also the question of, of value chains um, if we have maize coming from Tanzania into Mila, and it can reach a place like Wajia in Kenya where it's very dry, but you have a very simple and clear value and transport chain so that our products can reach all corners of the East African community. I think we would see a lot of, of, of tax benefits for, for all of us. All right. And so I'd leave it at that before any technical technological challenges hamper me further. Thank right, you. I was actually worried about those, but very quickly, uh, Jen did raise an issue around uh, Uganda really, uh, from the analysis, it looks like out of the partner states, Uganda is the one that has stuck to, you know, the, uh, the provisions really uh, in the treaty in relation to, uh, you know, uh, the taxes, uh, things like incentives. Uganda seems to have gone by the book, to the book. And yet the other countries seem to be further off. Uh, do, you, do you know why this is the case, especially uh, in relation uh, to Kenya? I would not give a reason per se, but I would definitely state that uh, Uganda is indeed a, a shining example to the rest of the region. Uh, it's not only just adherence to... Uh, the commitment of East African integration, but uh, uh, there's also just the mannerism in terms of being uh, not only proactive, but participatory. I think um, whenever they get a chance, maybe with their colleagues at uh, the African Tax Administrative Forum, I would encourage uh, them to maybe ask their colleagues to be more participatory with organizations such as us, because indeed, while we are still on a learning curve in terms of um, the, the technical issues and the capacity to contribute ideas and so forth. We still have uh, notions that could help their thinking in one form or the other. In our case, we are looking very uh, keenly about how to infuse human rights-based approaches to tax administration, tax justice, tax management, and so forth. So I think Uganda gives us a good example in terms of the collaboration between government and civil society, but also it can give an example to uh, its neighboring partners as well. Thanks. All right. Leonard, I'm going to uh, come back to uh, the panel here in Kampala, uh, but uh, hopefully you can uh, try and get uh, your video to work so that when we come back, uh, we are able uh, to see you. Uh, and Jane, now I'd like to come over to you. I'm sure there are a number of things you'd like uh, to respond to but uh, in the analysis you did raise uh, the issue around you you started by saying largely there's harmony around the east african region and uh, mr kagwa did state the same however later in your presentation uh, you came to specific aspects uh, where there was no uh, you know uh, it was hard to trace the the harmony and for example uh, in relation to rates. Mr. Kagwa says, you know, the, the, the spirit is not around the rates. Uh, and yet you do mention 
uh, rates as something important. For example, VAT income, uh, uh, you know, the taxes on income. Uh, why is this uh, important, uh, despite the fact that broadly there is harmony, at least from, uh, you know, the, the, let's call it the policy level? Um, thank you so much, Gabriel. And thank you, Moses and Abel, uh, for the, um, the responses to our, uh, our study. And also the comments from Leonard. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think the issues around rates have also been explained by Mr. Kagwa. Uh, issues around the domestic taxes being a preserve of parliament. And we, we appreciate that. We are sovereign sovereign countries, and as like uh, uh, Abel pointed out, unless and until when we get a common basket, maybe we'll be able to harmonize further. And um, also the issue which uh, Mr. Kagwa has raised about that it's about the laws, not the exact taxes, mm. that is 16% and 18%. But when it comes to income tax, what does it mean? Is it the same in Uganda? Is it the same in Kenya and Tanzania? But that be as it may, I, I, I think um, as we have all agreed, regional integration and tax harmonization go together. And we need to strive towards uh, tax harmonization. And I think we need to cede some of our sovereignty uh, for the sake of moving together as a region. And I think uh, the committee, the East African Committee on Fiscal Affairs could be given more roles to play. Not in terms of imposing, but in terms of advising, assessing how far we are towards moving to harmonization. Just, you know, assessing and also, and also advising even on uh, domestic taxes. Uh, maybe another issue which I wanted to point out um, is the issue, again, which has been raised by Mr. Kagon, the tax expenditure framework. And we would like to, to thank uh, government for, for coming up with uh, this uh, expenditure framework, uh, because it's really, really important to ensure that we get value for our money. Uh, um, government at least um, foregoes a lot of money in these tax incentives and tax exemptions, and I think we need to get our value for money. We need to see that the companies which get these incentives do what they are supposed to do, adhere to the conditionalities, employ our people, and even pr but provide decent employment. And I think that's why the issue of the uh, the, the, the threshold on the pa pa personal income tax is an issue which we can't exhaust here, but which we should really, really uh, discuss. People have to have a decent wage. People have to live in dignity. And I agree all of us have to make a, a contribution. But that contribution should be from um, a reasonable a reasonable amount of money. So, so, and I think that two go together, the issue of tax ex uh, incentive and tax exemption. People, companies are given tax exemptions, let them adhere to the conditions, let them source locally, let them export, let them provide decent, uh, decent jobs. Uh, maybe uh, lastly, the issue which you raised to Leonard I think it's important for Lena to tell us, uh, for countries like Kenya, um, countries like Uganda has applauded our relationship with uh, civil society and government. Um, in fact, most of our partners in other countries are asking us, how do you do it? You mean you sit with the Minister of Finance, with you are a and you debate these issues, and you talk, you know? And we say, okay, God is great, you know, that's Uganda. Um, but again, there is the issue of, of Uganda, the way, like you are saying, you, we are here, 
even our president adheres to the letter of the East African Treaty. That we, like I said, when you look at our, our, our local content bill, that's one of the reasons he raised. That domestic means ESC, but other countries are quiet about it. Uh, maybe Leonard can be able to tell us why isn't other countries, especially Kenya, his country, why aren't they doing this and what, what, what are they proposing to, to, how are they proposing to move forward? All right. Let's actually uh, get Leonard to respond to that. And Leonard, uh, since we are out of time, uh, we're not going to end with recommendations. We're going to end with each of us citing the opportunities we see uh, right now, uh, because since this is the first ESC post-budget and tax dialogue, we plan to have one next year as well. Uh, so uh, opportunities that we can take advantage of, so that next time we say that in this area we have managed you know, to cover this ground. Leonard, I hope you, could, you were able to hear the question. Yes, indeed. Excellent. Uh, uh, the only unfortunate thing is the, the, the video. We will go with the picture. It's okay. Please go ahead, Leonard. <laughs> well, I think um, there is, and to speak directly to the question from Jen, there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a um, history and an orientation in which Uganda has always viewed itself in terms of uh, its place in the regional integration uh, discussion and debates over the years, uh, coming directly from your head of state, uh, President um, Seven. Um, for us, I think uh, on a political level, uh, the East Africa community is a side issue. Nonetheless, um, we are looking for opportunities particularly with our parliamentarians to I, to give them this idea that there is more out there for our economy. So it is partly a, a, a political debate where they will have to kind of how to see how Kenya fits in into the regional economy, but also how does that fit in terms of our domestic reality? How do we live by being Kenyans and also as East Africans. So essentially, other than our efforts to speak to our parliamentarians directly through every budget process that we engage, there is also the engagement that we are uh, taking, uh, taking at the East African Legislative Assembly. Um, this is where a number of our leaders again meet, and we then have to present these cases so that if indeed it's not happening domestically, for instance, there's an avenue that will kind of champion this and alert the domestic constituencies to those realities. That is just the parliament. But also, there are instances in which there is contestation on policy. Uh, so whenever the opportunity arises, civil society might just take the chance to use the East African Court of Justice through public interest litigation so that these interpretations might uh, bring forth to light some of the challenges that we are facing and might help force our governments to take the questions of regional integration more seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with uh, Jen and actually come this way uh, on uh, opportunities. Thank you. Uh, the opportunities I see uh, it might be um, because, like they say, every cloud has a silver lining. COVID has battered our economies, you know, and I think it's an opportunity for us to be able to look at our region uh, together, you know, to be able to trade, increase more trade, increase more cooperation, so that we get out of uh, out of. Uh, uh, this crisis, this economic crisis. And one of the areas is to be able to promote more trade and therefore also to use tax harmonization as a tool to promote that trade. Thank you, Jen. Yes, uh, Mr. Thank Kabumire. you. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, the biggest opportunity I see with the ESC uh, as someone who is in charge of all the borders in Uganda, 
I've been in URA for about 20 years and in the, the customs department. There's a time trucks would come from Kenya, enter Uganda, offload goods, and go back empty. As I speak now, about 30% of the trucks go loaded. What does that tell you? It means the government policy on import substitution, on industrialization, is, is being beginning to bear fruit. We are doing some export. We are doing export. I don't mind whether we're exporting, the, exporting them raw. It's better than not exporting at all. At least we are exporting, whether raw, whether improved on. I'm seeing growth in our exports year in every, every other year. Even as a region, we have now started competing in other markets, in DRC, okay? We are even stretching beyond DRC. We are looking for markets beyond Africa and even within Africa, under the Africa continental free trade area. So me, I think as a region, we've reached a level where we have increased our production to the extent that we even have surplus to export. And that is the biggest opportunity we have as long as we continue to integrate and work together and harmonize. I submit. Thank you. Uh, I am seeing URA and Siatini organizing that next year when we do this, after we have URA speaking, we'll have KRA, TRA, and the rest. And then, you know, properly, we're having a discussion about uh, taxes uh, in East Africa. Uh, Mr. Kagwa. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my parting shot is to say that uh, uh, going forward, we as East Africans should realize that uh, we have a lot of uh, cultural and uh, social and economic ties, which we can exploit and explore when we really want to have a harmonized regime, not only for uh, taxation, but could be for industrialization, it could be for harmonization of standards, for so many things. Uh, we have uh, artists in Uganda, we have artists in Kenya, we have uh, people uh, uh, near the border in uh, uh, Tanzania who actually speak the same language like Ugandans. Even uh, when you look at South Sudan, some of our people in West Nile can actually relate quite uh, uh, much with that. So th th there is that think that we are actually brothers and sisters in this and we can do things to promote ourselves. There is a market now of about 250 million people. Though we don't have a lot of aggregate demand because uh, so many people are poor, but the opportunities that uh, if an investor looks at ESC as one investment des destination, then they should uh, uh, see the opportunities. So as much as possible, this brings in uh, these issues of uh, harmonization, how important they are. Because if we have a harmonized uh, tax regime, they will help, help in the free movement of goods um, and services across the region. So I think for me, those are the opportunities I see. The other opportunity that I'm seeing is that now we have uh, the East Africa, the African uh, uh, free continental trade area which uh, needs us as East Africans to explore the markets in, the, in Africa. Algeria, they need our milk. Nigeria, they need our, our maize. And so many, so there are so many opportunities that are coming up. And if we stop looking inward, I think the prospects are there. And I've also seen that, for example, when we are working on the uh, East African crude oil uh, pipeline project, we worked very well with Tanzania. We harmonized the taxes, the domestic taxes in both countries on how the transactions and the income of the eco project are, are, are going to be taxed. So it's harmonized, and I think those things are going to follow. I also noted that we still have avenues for discussions. So there's opportunities. Kenya came to Uganda and said, you people, we have come to Uganda to establish whether you have capacity.
to supply us with sugar so that we can uh, allow you to bring sugar. Because there was, there was a lot of uh, um, issues, contention as to whether you, you know, Uganda had capacity to, to supply that we have excess uh, uh, sugar. So the, the, the fact that we can talk as a partner state, I think that would be, uh, it will go a long way to make sure that we harmonize our policies. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Kagua, Mr. Kagumire, and uh, Madam Jen Nalunga, and of course, Mr. Wanyama joining us online. Uh, thank you very much for your deliberations. Uh, let's give them a hand clap as they take their seats. Because of time, I would like to actually immediately invite our next panel. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, the team to help me sanitize these very quickly as uh, the other panel comes up. And now we're actually going to be focusing on uh, a people-centered and market-driven cooperation. For those of you that are joining us uh, via the social media platforms and Zoom in particular, please use the options there for uh, your questions and your comments. I believe that the team uh, the technical team will bring your questions and comments to my attention uh, when they do see them. Now on this panel, uh, I will have uh, Mr. Julius Mukunda, uh, the Executive Director, Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group, CSBAG. Uh, Mr. Mukunda, you're very welcome. Please make him feel welcome. <laughs> Ms. Sheila Kawamara, Mishambi, Executive Director, Eastern African Sub-Region Support Initiative for the Advancement of Women. You're very welcome. I am advised that uh, we'll have two people joining us virtually, uh, and I'd like to check if Mr. Kenneth Apollo uh, Bagamuhunda Chair, I'm present. Ah, excellent. That's uh, Director General Customs and Trade, East African Community. Uh, do we have uh, Mr. Ones? Uh, I believe it's Onesmas uh, Niyukuri. An expert. It is Mr. Onesime. Oh, Onesime. I beg your pardon. Oh, there you are. Expert international yes, trade. Yes, Mr. Onesime. And I'm online. Eh? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I'd actually like to begin with the panelists that we have joining us online. Uh, it's unfortunate that we do not have much time. Uh, we'll be going off uh, very soon. Um, if you could begin by uh, focusing on or helping us unpack uh, the non-tariff barriers and how uh, they've impacted on uh, the East African community intra-trade. It was mentioned uh, in a number of the presentations. And let me start uh, with Mr. Uh, uh, Bagamu Hunda. Uh, 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 thank you, Chairperson. And uh, I want to express my appreciation for being invited by Siatini to participate in this discussion. And uh, it is, comes on, it's very timely. I think such kind of discourse are usually very enriching at such a times, particularly looking at the uh, analysis of the post-budget. And I want to appreciate the, the analysis that was presented in regard to tax harmonization, because tax harmonization relates very much to the topic that we are also talking about. I think in looking at non-tariff barriers and all these and any other barriers, whatever barriers it is to the integration process, one needs to understand the underlying motive of uh, economic integration. Uh, if you look at the ESC perspective, the underlying drive for economic integration was the need to promote trade through market expansion definitely the, 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 the whole concept was premised on the aspect of the bringing countries together and uh, leveraging on the population and economies of scale that are created. 
through that market expansion. And this also goes to, to the extent of how the market, the market efficiency. And when you are talking about market efficiency, that's when you look at uh, removing barriers that impede trade. Uh, related to this also, the need to promote investment, industrialization, to enhance competitiveness, to also uh, strengthen the ESC position in the global trade arena. I think Mr. Kagwa talked about talked about the the issue of CFTA, and I think it is one of the reasons that we need to strengthen our cooperation and integration in order to be able to participate effectively and take advantage of the the the, the new bigger markets that are coming in place. And of course, uh, enhancing productivity, value addition, and uh, enhance services, trading services. Now, these, are, these, these objectives were intended where we would be achieved through specific policy interventions, uh, first and foremost, policy harmonization, and the uh, uh, development of common policies. And uh, this would be attained through a customs union, which is the, the, the trade in goods, basically, to free the movement of trade in goods across the region. Also, the common market, which adds on the factors of production and the monetary union, which brings in the monetary and physical aspects. And uh, this would be attained through common laws and regulations. Now, when you look at the main tenants of the East African community, customs union, they are basically three. One was to eliminate internal tariffs so that there are no tariffs across the region for goods that are traded between partner states. And this was attained through a progressive basis starting with the transitional period of five years, and eventually we attained the 100% the internal tariff elimination after five years in 2010. And, uh, but this one, of course, is premised on uh, some rules, rules of origin on how goods can be able to be traded so that you don't have um, goods being brought from outside and traded as if they are made in East Africa. And I think the essence of this is also to encourage production within the region so that the goods that are traded free in the region are those that are produced in the region or meet certain criteria. And these conditions were are intended also to enhance local capacities, both technological uh, and uh, in, in, production, and even human capital. And uh, the other tenant that was uh, underlying the customs union is the elimination of, uh, rather, uh, the common external tariff, so that we trade on a harmonious basis with third parties. And, and if you do that, then within the customs union, you attain the, the variation is eliminated so that there is no motive of countries uh, having their own policy on tariffs so that the rest to the bottom you're talking about and the other distortions that are brought about in trade because of having varying external tariffs would be eliminated. And, uh, and this, to an extent, was attained, although we have some challenges right now in terms of sustainability of our common external tariff. But to a, to a greater extent, I think from the beginning, we started from a very high note having a common external tariff. And the third one was to eliminate the non-tariff barriers. And non-tariff barriers was out of a realization that much as we can, have, we can remove the internal tariff, much as we can have the external, the, a common external tariff, we will not have 
a, a full customs union unless we remove the barriers that impede trade in goods. And, uh, and I think this was uh, the, the, the driver of internal trade in East Africa. Uh, I, however, think that uh, as we look at non-tariff barriers, we should not restrict ourselves on rate goods, but we should look at barriers that impede also trading services, and we should also look at barriers that impede other movement of, movement of other factors, capital, labor, enterprise. There are also barriers that impede their movement. So... In, in, in essence, the elimination of internal tariff was a big priority in terms of, of, of the EAC integration. All right. Uh, just and, and, and unfortunately, just, I have to... I'm just concluding. I'm just concluding. Uh, the NTBs now, what has been done? Let me summarize that, then I conclude. One is that the EAC... B is one of the most unique wrecks that it has an NTB law, which was enacted by parliament and as assented to by all heads of state. We have an NTB regulation. We put in place an NTB time-bound program, which uh, looked at the, non the types and categories of uh, NTBs and an NTB reporting mechanism platform which is electronic and to this to this on this one we have even rolled it out to the TFT area Comesa and SADAC and we have national monitoring committees in place which look at NTBs from the national level that are reported and then a regional non tariff non uh, national a regional monitoring committee the importance of the private sector is very critical in this aspect and they are members of this NTBs. Uh, Chair, I think uh, with that, uh, I, 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 I stop here. Maybe I will add on whatever is remaining later if I have the opportunity. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Let's go over to uh, Mr. Uh, Onesime in, uh, I believe, Burundi. If you could just update us on the negotiations under the uh, African Continental Free Trade Area. It was mentioned here uh, and the opportunities there. And uh, how, exact, how, how is Burundi uh, benefiting from it? And how can other partners uh, benefit from those opportunities? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. And um, good morning to all the... A distinguished delegates on the panel and also those who had participating virtually. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be part of this panel and uh, I would like to thank Siatini and uh, the partners for organizing this uh, uh, dialogue uh, around the harmonization of tax uh, around the ESC uh, partner state. Uh, uh, it is really uh, an important topic that we are discussing and uh, uh, we commend the, the study that is being developed and we hope that maybe when it is fully uh, adopted or maybe presented, we think that maybe partner state or we learn and uh, uh, from the recommendations that uh, are being developed, they may uh, see uh, the ways and the uh, around the study how uh, tax harmonization can be implemented in uh, fully in east africa um, regarding the update on uh, negotiations at the afcfta uh, continental free trade area uh, am i being heard chair yes we can hear you please go right ahead Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you remember that uh, negotiations started uh, uh, long ago uh, around the, uh, on trading goods and trade on services as phase one, and the member states, uh, union, uh, African Union member states, uh, 
been negotiating around the the aspects on trade uh, in service and uh, trade in services and trade in goods and uh, you remember that uh, in trading goods uh, member state has to develop on three categories where 90% uh, of the tariff lines uh, may be um, uh, there is a reduction of or maybe elimination of tariffs on the, on those products and another category of products where maybe partner st member state feel that they, they are on a progressive there will be liberalization around the 10 years five years according to the category of member state uh, there is also category C, uh, where uh, partner member state feel that maybe this uh, sector or this product uh, will feel that it is not uh, the right time to liberalize, to fully liberalize on those products. Then it turns around the uh, 3%, where uh, on a sensitive product, uh, it turns around uh, 7%, which uh, together uh, combined become 10%, uh, remaining on the 90% where countries uh, have to uh, liberalize uh, immediately when the uh, the agreement come into force. Uh, on trading services, uh, member states uh, also agreed to liberalize uh, in most of the sectors, but for this time, uh, five priority sectors have been set. Uh, and the countries are negotiating, and uh, also uh, member states were supposed to submit their uh, initial offers. And uh, for your information, ESC uh, as a block, as a community, we negotiate uh, as a block, and then we're supposed to have our common uh, offer, initial offer, where we are partner state. It seems like uh, we had it on the uh, specific. All right, it's okay. Your network has uh, gone off for a bit, but it's back on, so you can continue. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe it's uh, internet. Uh, I was just saying on uh, ESC, we negotiate as a block, and the uh, partner state have already developed their initial offers in the five priority sectors, which has been submitted in uh, late December 2020 at the African Union. Uh, where uh, uh, the secretariat of the AFCFT uh, has to comment uh, the offer, whether on trade in goods or on trade uh, in services. And uh, uh, some of the comments have already been uh, submitted to the ESC secretariat, and then uh, meetings have been held uh, in order for partner state to look at the uh, comments that have been made to our offer and then uh, looking uh, go back and see whether at the national we may whether if it is to clarify on some of instances on some of the criteria used to or to prepare our offer as a block so negotiations now are still going but uh, as we are here now we may uh, I may inform you that uh, we still have some uh, uh, areas where member states have not yet uh, agreed on. Uh, that is maybe for trading services on rules of origin to agree the criteria of rules of origin, how they can be determined for the products that uh, member state felt that they may uh, bring as uh, liberalized so uh, negotiations now are still going, but uh, maybe uh, I remember that the summit, head of state summit of December 2020, directed the uh, member states that uh, they have to finalize all uh, remaining areas where we did not agree, whether in trading services or trading goods. Uh, and then uh, negotiations are still going. Uh, and we think that uh, with the deadline that has been given, uh, member states will be able 
uh, to agree on some of the issues that are still pending in these uh, negotiations on trade in services and trade in goods. Uh, you remember also intertrade began with the 1st of January 2021. Uh, 2021. Uh, let me just say. Recording stopped. Sorry about that. Please go on. Oh, yes. Recording uh, in progress. Then uh, negotiations, uh, trade, inter-trade uh, between African countries has been launched in January, and uh, uh, it means that now uh, negotiations are, be, uh, are still going, and also inter-trade between uh, member states is also have been launched, and may maybe the problem now is still on the pending issues where where countries have not yet agreed on. So Burundi is also benefiting from these uh, negotiations, um, uh, participating as a, one of the EAC partner state. It mm. also gives a power for us to negotiate and also to be heard during these negotiations. All right. uh, because sometimes uh, we, we have a uh, preparation meetings, uh, preparatory meetings at the EAC level, uh, where either on trading goods or trading services, we have to get a uh, common understanding of what EAC really want to benefit from this AFCFTA agreement. And uh, each partner state has uh, its own uh, ways or maybe the understanding or the benefits right. or gains that they want to, and to gain from the AFCFTA. Okay, uh, very broadly, uh, in these negotiations, are the East African partner states negotiating as a block, or is each country looking out for its uh, interests? Very, very uh, directly. Uh, we negotiate as a block, but each partner state remains sovereign, you know. <laughs> yes, we are on the EAC uh, level, and uh, you remember also we have now the trade policy, the regional trade policy uh, that has been developed. Of course, uh, some of the aspects have been uh, harmonized, but uh, uh, broadly, when we are negotiating, uh, partner state has their own interests, what right. they are looking uh, for, because you may find, for example, in trade and services, where in one subsector or sector, a country has wished to liberalize, another partner state did not wish. So uh, when we are negotiating or when we want to be heard, we go as a block. But when then it comes to, to negotiations, as a bilateral, then it is then for each partner state uh, to look the ways uh, where the sectors or maybe on the product that they want to liberalize, what really do they want? But okay. uh, we then come back as a ESC, and because we, you know, we have a customs union and also external uh, tariff, then uh, whatever we can do. We remember that at EAC, we have reached the level where whatever we can do, we cannot, uh, 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 let me just say, uh, whether it is on tariff or maybe whether it is on external tariff, we remember that EAC has reached this level and then each partner state has to take into consideration this aspect. All right. Thank you very much. Allow me to come back into the room. I'll just ask one more technical question. And then uh, we'll lighten it up a little bit. And I'd like to put this to uh, Mr. Mukunda. It is clear from the conversations that we are having that there is uh, a mismatch when it comes to uh, linking taxes and uh, allocations and uh, accountability in the, in the region. Where exactly is this mismatch? And how do we start to untangle? Yes, I mean, the, the discussion on tax really, you know, it is, it's very complicated until you hear the, the tax collector, uh, the policy person, uh, and you, the, the, the tax, uh, the, 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 pay, the, the person who pays the taxes. Uh, you, you get humbled because it, it's full of so many issues. I think one is uh, when it comes to the collection and then the services, every country would want to see having increased revenues into the coffers to deliver services. But now we have these regional and regional protocols, international protocols, that we feel if we join 
we are able to, to, to get more benefits. But I think first, it is very, very important and critical that we understand the cost and the benefits of these protocols. Because when you hear Jane telling us that when it comes to harmonization, then there are certain balances, especially on capital gains tax. Because I was looking at capital gains tax. In Uganda, it is above 20%. Above, above in Kenya, they are having it at 5%. Uh, simply because I think for Kenyans, they realize that actually they need to protect their, 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 their trade in, in, in that particular area. And I think for us, probably we are, we are a bit, I don't know if we are being a bit more liberal, but I mean, we are, our, our rates are, are very high. So what should we do to ensure that we can harmonize so that if I want to invest in any properties, in any services that are likely to attract the capital gains tax, I'm able to be able to say, okay, Uganda and Kenya and Tanzania, people in the region, we are almost in a similar, in, in a similar ranges. The second important element I think for me is um, the, the whole issue around uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, common external tariffs, but also especially the issue to deal with the, uh, these common markets. I, again, as we try to collect more taxes, then you are told, do you know what? Uh, you are in this particular market like Comesa uh, or in the East African uh, uh, common market. And as such, they are, these goods and services will not attract this particular kind of tax. And this is where you have been getting a lot of money. So if the cost tends to be higher than what you are looking to benefit from the trade, I think it's very, very important that we also look at that particular component and see how much money we are losing vis-a-vis -vis what we are gaining. I was happy to hear that now, uh, with the policies in place, that a number of trucks that come to Uganda, fully loaded, go back at least half loaded. I think it's, 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 it tells you that, yes, we are likely to benefit from this. And also to, to explain to our policy makers the implication. Uh, lastly, for me, is on transparency and accountability. I think it's, 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 it's quite very important for us to understand uh, these, uh, the implication of these policies and, 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 and procedures that the East Africans, we need to understand and say, uh, in Kenya, these are the rates. In Uganda, these are the rates. If I'm trading in Kenya, this is what I'm likely to pay. If I'm trading in Uganda, this is what I'm likely to pay. But on certain borders, like if you go to Sudan, for example, I mean, it becomes a bit, it's, it's, it's different. It's different. But Kenya, Uganda, we tend to be on the same, probably on the same line. So I think it's tax information and in a user-friendly manner is, is very, 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 very important. So that for businesses, the small and medium enterprises, they are likely to understand the implication of the tax they are, they are likely to pay on, 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 on to their businesses. Mm. And uh, we're seeing URA having even a mission of being transparent and accountable. I think that's a very good uh, way to go along with and at the same time to find that we can be at this level to debate tax issues with the, with government, especially the Ministry of Finance and, and URA, I think it's very credible because I think five years ago we didn't have this, but having this tells you that we are all interested in this country and we don't want to grow. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Let me come over to Sheila. Broadly, what we want, these policies are supposed to be people-centered. As we come up with all these things, the people should be at the center. And so I'd like to start with a broad one for you, uh, just putting in context the things that we have had. And uh, to, uh, for, you know, from the beginning of this discussion, uh, are they focused on the people? Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, and I, I would like to thank all our previous uh, presenters and also discussants. Um, I think to me, uh, when we thought of the revival of the East African community, maybe as a people of East Africa, we were a bit of ambitious uh, to think that uh, we would be part of the <coughs> solution for the East African community, given that uh, previously it was politician-based and it had collapsed in our faces. And I think we have not moved very much from what we had in 1970 seven or what we saw collapsing as the East African community. Because uh, well, it is well intended for the people, but are we actually delivering to the people? Uh, uh, as a YASI, which is the Eastern African Sub-Regional Support Initiative for the Advancement of Women, we work across the region. And uh, 
we are working at uh, 20 borders across the Eastern African community, including the DRC at Goli and Mahagi. And the, of course, out of all the revenue authorities so far, Uganda Revenue Authority excels. It is uh, really a star performer across the region in terms of uh, providing information. Yeah. In terms of involving the people and trying to reach out really to the real taxpayer. Uh, <clears throat> as ASC, we have offices actually, with, we share like offices with URA uh, at the borders of Elegu, at the border of Malaba, Busia, uh, Mutukula, uh, and even the new one which is being constructed at Golimahagi. So it kind of, we work with the women cross border traders. These are the majority of traders. Uh, sometimes when we are talking about traders across the region, we tend to focus on the big trailer movement of goods. But actually the majority of traders are the small traders. And those are the women cross-border traders, the men cross-border traders, who sometimes do not have the information. So when we are talking about harmonization of tax, it, for these people it is real that uh, if I don't understand the Uganda tax regime, then I'm trading across the region. Then I take my goods across Kenya, then I'm moving on to Tanzania. I want my goods in Burundi. But as uh, given the levels of education and literacy rates for the small traders, really, we cannot comprehend those huge books, URA, KRA, TRA, or the RAs use. So it becomes very, very complicated for an ordinary trader. So when Mr. Kagwa mentions that laws have been harmonized, mm. thank God they have been harmonized. But has the tax administration been harmonized? To us, that is where the reality is. Because I'm dealing with the tax collector. Abel tells us, come next month, we are starting implementation. It scares everybody. Mm. And as long as the tax uh, administration is not harmonized. I can assure you, smuggling becomes very lucrative. Because if the tax collectors are going to confuse us at uh, the border crossing, then I go in the bushes. And that's where we have challenges. So we need the laws to be harmonized. We need the taxes, uh, at least the administration, to be harmonized so that we understand what's going on. Because when I'm a, a trader, or an investor in the region. I want to have a clear playing field where I know the rules of the game are going to be uh, similar. Mr. Bagamhunda has told us that uh, across the region they have tried to make uh, true. There are certain landmarks we have crossed. But uh, for the ordinary person, these landmarks are still vague. Mm. And we need more clarity. All right. We need to go actually to Mr. Bagamunda uh, to talk to us about how clarity uh, can be brought uh, to those uh, provisions uh, that have been harmonized. I hope you can hear us. I, I, I hear you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I think I, I do agree with the uh, with the the previous speaker, panelist, uh, uh, Kawamala, on about to what extent has what we have put in place, the laws, the, the procedures, the various uh, mechanisms that we have set, in, set up impacted on uh, the citizenry or the people of East Africa who are involved in cross-border transactions. I think we, we still have a challenge, challenges in in as far as implementation of these laws and awareness creation of the laws and uh, procedures and systems that are in place. I, however, want to first talk on the positive side. Much as there is a lot of recurrence, there is recurrence of non-tariff barriers across the region. There are more, more non-tariff barriers that have been solved than those which have remained. Actually, we were taking stock of them recently, and we found that we had already done about 70% of those barriers. And recently, really, there has been even a new motivation and goodwill 
between partner states to eliminate the barriers, like recently Tanzania and Kenya had a very fruitful meeting at high level, starting with the heads of state and then the ministerial. And out of about 30, 30 35, I think 20 were resolved, 22 were resolved there and then. I think the same has happened between Uganda and Kenya, and I think there is also a lot of progress between Tanzania and Uganda. And I think this is a welcome move. Of course, it is unfortunate that the, the, the drive to remove some of these barriers is highly dependent on, uh, on, the, political, on the political basis uh, in, in terms rather than a system driven or a, a rule driven uh, that we, rules that we put in place because uh, the likelihood of them re reoccurring is higher than if they are really embedded in in a system, uh, an established system or rules that are in place. So uh, I think what we need to do is to get involvement of the private sector, to involve the small and medium enterprises that trade across. Uh, and one of the things that also has come out is the effectiveness of the laws that were put in place, like that of the NTB. To what extent is it enforceable? what extent and we are trying now we are revising it to make it more enforceable put in place sanctions to both institutions and individuals that put in that uh, that uh, uh, create non-tariff barriers so the the, the 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 whole aspect you see the implementation of the integration process is not dependent only in arusha by the secretariat it is actually more in the partner state the partner states need to put in that drive. But if you see the challenges that we have, for example, in the tax harmonization process, what has delayed it? It has been in place. We have, this thing has been on our table since we started with the double taxation agreement in 1998. We started doing the, the harmonization process in 2005 of the domestic taxes, but we have moved very slowly. Some of it is because of the hesitancy at the policy level, at the national level, because they think that the regional initiatives is eating into the policy space. So we need to really rally the, 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 the policy implementers at partner state level to be the drivers of the implementation process. And I think the creation of the ministries of ESC was essentially for that. All right. To drive and lead and champion that. So you, I, I agree we need to really make clarity of what we have in place and get everybody on board so that we can implement the policies that are made at the regional level. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We need to uh, be... Maybe, maybe chair, chair, one thing that I need to point out about the challenges that we have on NTBs. Some of them is a creation of competitiveness amongst the private players. They are the ones who lobby to put, to impose barriers by the partner states. There, there has been cases we know about that private sector also participates sometimes in creating non-tariff barriers so that they can impede or, or, or outcompete their, their, their counterparts coming from the other partner states. Thank you. All right. I wonder how that uh, ends up, you know, taking priority over, you know, uh, what the policy at the national level uh, or at the ESC uh, should be. But thank you very much for uh, raising that, Brea, and highlighting uh, that issue. We need to be bringing this to a close. Uh, I know specifically, uh, specifically that uh, the viewers on NTV uh, will be leaving us very soon, but would also like to hear from you. Uh, so, I know that some people on Zoom have sent in questions. If the technical team could help uh, bring those questions to my attention uh, so that our panelists can quickly respond to them. Uh, Mr. Mukunda, uh, how do we start to now make uh, those alignments? Because the interests are quite many. Uh, and now even private sector, uh, you know, uh, seems to have interests that are against the spirit of uh, the ESC community. Yeah, I, I think I think this is a, 
it's inevitable really. Uh, but I think for me, what gives me hope is that Rome was not built in one day. Mm. And when you, when you see even where the EU is, uh, the kind of challenges they have faced. Uh, when you come to East Africa, and I think all of these challenges are not, are, not, uh, are not insurmountable. We can address them. We need, like, there is something that Jen said, that we need to part a bit of our sovereignty. But if we want everything that we must, it is ours and ourselves, then that's one of the biggest impediments. We, we, the, 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 there is the issue where we are going to say that uh, probably at, at one point there are some powers uh, that we need to you know, secede and give to the regional body. For example, like certification really. Certification is critical and very important. But if we have different standards, Kenya has the different standards, Rwanda has the different standards. I mean, it, it would be difficult for all of us to, trade in, to have the same trading area because the standards are different. Yeah, and we are seeing the effects of that. You say uh, you're not meeting our standard. Yes, but which standard? Yes, and that's, that's another non-trade barrier. So uh, for me is that there are certain things we need to deliberately, as, as a community really, to deliberately say, let's hand over this to our technocrats because they are the best who can help us manage some of these things. That's the number one. Number two, I think also is uh, political leadership is also very important. Is that if we are not able to appreciate the benefits of some of these policies and procedures at the national level, it's going to be extremely very difficult. So political leadership, um, I mean, for Uganda, I mean, we are lucky that really uh, that the, our president is, 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 a, is a champion of the East African community. But at the same time, I think we also need to educate our private sector to see how they can be able to, uh, to, to benefit and compete, uh, and, compete in the, and, and compete in the region. So different for me is that uh, it, it, it's quite very important that those two areas, uh, providing more support to the Secretariat to guide us on, on a number of things, and also to have more uh, education uh, in at the national level on the benefits of some of these persons at the regional level. Thank you. All right. Again, as we bring this to a close, uh, I'd like to come to Mr. Onesime on the issue of, uh, uh, you know, ceding some of our sovereignty for the greater good. Uh, your views on that? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, normally, you know, uh, each partner state uh, remains, uh, of course, uh, sovereign. And uh, you remember that uh, we are looking to the bigger uh, integration, the ESC, uh, political integration. Uh, if we then we reach to this level of the uh, federation, uh, I think this is where now we have to submit <laughs> our sovereignty to the spra uh, figure of the community and then uh, maybe if we reach uh, to that level we may uh, think that and it is where now ESC really is looking for uh, so that uh, we reach uh, to the full integration in the in the ESC uh, then with this level uh, of integration uh, I think uh, for now, where each partner state uh, still maybe has some inter internal uh, procedures and uh, which may differ from another partner state, uh, that's where uh, countries uh, may, uh, or partner states still uh, 